subscribe to our YouTube channel and press the bell icon to get the latest updates. Hello everyone. Over the last few days, the COVID-19 pandemic seems to have turned an ominous corner with the World Health Organization warning about a possible global third wave and in our own country, revenge travelers have sent alarm bells ringing in the government. Vaccines which at one point of time had seemed like the holy grail now seem to have questions hovering over them because of a flurry of mutants. To discuss all of this, we have with us today Dr. Monica Gandhi, infectious disease doctor at UCSF. Uh, she special specializes in HIV, um, so, so she basically has experience of another pandemic, um, but has also been one of the most powerful and original voices through the current pandemic. Welcome, Dr. Gandhi, and thank you so much for doing this. Thank you. Uh, so tell me, uh, are we really headed for a global third wave? You know, you just sort of said it in the right way, in my opinion, which is that we have had these vaccines since December 2020. And the fact that we're even in this point of July 2021, talking about a global third wave, when we've had nine effective vaccines, to me is we will never get over the stain and the moral and ethical stain that has happened, in my opinion, that we did not get out these vaccines more quickly. So, you know, um, it really all depends on global imperatives and global responses at this point. We have seen very clearly that if you give out vaccines quickly, you can actually reduce transmission even as a wave is happening. For example, as uh, waves were happening in the United States in March, by the time we got to 40% first dose vaccination in places like Michigan, which were having increases, cases started coming down. So there is no doubt that we can avert any of these outcomes that you just said. And uh, I'll never get over the fact that we, that we are saying we're gonna vaccinate the world by the end of 2022. We need to vaccinate now and we need to get these vaccines out. Um, in terms of what you just asked also, yes, it is tragic that there's been more deaths recorded in 2021 than there has in 2020. And we've only been through seven months of 2021 and we have the solution. So yes, we are in a very, very dangerous period right now in the world. So uh, tell me about mutants. I mean, I've been hearing your interviews and you've been very forceful that uh, you don't think mutants will break through vaccines. Um, but here in India, especially, we've, we've been seeing this Delta, Delta Plus, all of those things, our vaccination rates are very poor, we've come to that. But do you think vaccines, all vaccines will work against all mutants? Can we say something like that? Yes, it's a really good question. So, you know, we really have to discuss the immune system for a second to answer that question, because there really are two arms of the immune system. And there are B cells, which produce antibodies, and there are T cells. And the thing about T cells is they prevent us from having severe disease with COVID. And it's hard with any mutant to avoid T cell immunity, because T cell immunity is very in breadth across the entire spike protein. There's multiple cells that go across the entire spike protein around 80 to 87. And thus, if you have 10 mutations with the Delta variant or 11 with the Delta plus, you still can't evade T cell immunity. However, there is a problem. You may be able to evade the other arm of the immune system, which is that B cells produce antibodies. And we're seeing with each mutant, with the Delta variant, for example, that antibodies, it's taking more doses. It's taking, um, there is reduced antibody responses against the Delta variant. So for example, we can get through the Delta variant with two doses, but we can never get it through it with one dose of the two dose vaccines. And that wasn't true of the Alpha variant. We could actually get away with one dose. So because of that, we are seeing this. And what will the antibodies do? Well, they prevent transmission because they're in the nose. And so they will prevent you from transmitting after you've had a vaccine. And they also can help you with preventing mild disease. So we're going to see more breakthroughs, even mild breakthroughs if we don't stop the ongoing transmission of COVID-19. So do I think they're fundamentally gonna 
evade all immunity, not all immunity, but it's going to get worse with one arm of our immune system if we mm -hmm. keep on going. Right. Uh, before I come to my next question, there's a since since you mentioned this these two arms of the immune system, a lot of people after they have gotten vaccinated and they have passed the requisite number of days go and do an antibody test and they find that the antibody test results are not good enough and they get very disappointed that uh, the vaccine is not working. What would you say to them? You know, that's the other thing to remember is that the immune system is redundant and complex. So your antibodies may not show up high in your bloodstream, but your T cell response might be just fine. And right now we are really not recommending measuring antibodies after you've had the vaccine because of this other arm of the immune system, T cells, which are so hard to measure. And it doesn't necessarily predict that you're not going, that you're not yet not immune. So I would say don't do antibody testing. <laughs> um, uh, and it really can make you very, like you said, disappointed and concerned. There are two groups of people who we're going to be looking at for boosters right now in the world. And they are immunocompromised and the very elderly. Those are the uh, patients that are going to be next on the docket for looking at a third shot of the vaccine. There was just a study today um, that showed that it's likely we're going to get immunocompromised people a third shot relatively soon. But for immunocompetent people, there is no indication that checking your antibodies is going to to predict your effectiveness of the vaccines. And really it's a function of your immune system and frankly, how much virus is in the community. If there's a lot of virus in the community, you still, even if you've had a vaccine, I would still protect myself with the mask. If there's low virus in the community, that's when the mask can come off. Right. But, uh, so uh, would, but uh, at a, maybe at a later date, uh, would immunocompetent people also need a booster dose? Because it's been eight months or so that the vaccines have been, I mean, we've started administering vaccines globally. It's a great question. So right now, like you said, December 2020 was the first rollout of the vaccine. So now we're almost at eight months in high income countries who, who started in December 2020. There's also people who got the vaccines in the context of the clinical trials. And remember that was back in the summer of 2020. And those patients are being monitored closely. They're still in the clinical trials, they're still being monitored and they are not seeing breakthrough infections in those patients. So the fact that we aren't seeing very high rate of breakthrough even in people who've had it over a year, Number one. Number two, the fact that we have very robust T cell immunity that develops from the vaccines. And number three, I told you about B cells, but one important thing to remember about B cells is you have B cells and you have what are called memory B cells that actually go and sit in a bank for a long time, your personal bank. Your bank is your lymph nodes or your bone marrow. That's where your memory B cells form. We have good data that you actually can biopsy lymph nodes, see memory B cells forming after the vaccines. Those memory B cells can last a long time. So I don't think that immunocompetent are gonna need boosters soon. Will they need them in the future? Maybe, maybe five years, maybe 10 years. I don't know the duration yet because it's, we're, we're gonna be monitoring these patients from the clinical trials, but not likely on a yearly basis, not at all. That's actually very good news because if I remember correctly, the first Moderna shot was administered in March, 2020. And yeah, the, I, that's yeah, awesome. maybe not that long ago. I think that most of the clinical trials, you're right, they started really fast, but I think it was more July of 2020. Um, and that, so we now have a year's worth of data and it's not like those patients aren't being followed. You don't get out of a clinical trial for something this important. You're going right. to be watched for a while. Right. And these patients are going to be, these participants are going to be watched for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. uh, but while right on the subject of variants and vaccines and all of that, um, Vaccine breakthrough is one thing, but do you think some of the mutants can break through uh, like the immunity that uh, you get from prior infection? Do you think some of the mutants can break through that without that? Yeah, that's a very good question. So the question of natural immunity 
is an important one because we wish no one got natural infection, but it happened. Clearly it happened. And there are many people who are now likely immune for a while from the virus, from natural immunity. So for example, there have been now big studies in Israel. There was a study in the Cleveland Clinic and there's other studies in the UK that asked the question, okay, if you've had natural infection, do you get reinfection readily even when there are variants emerging? And what we have found from these studies and again, it's only been a year because March 2020 is really when the epidemic, the pandemic took off. So we can only say a year and two months, but reinfection rates after natural infection seem to be as low as they are after vaccines so far. And that is even with variants because the alpha, beta, gamma, delta have emerged. And why is that? It goes back to those T cells, that those T cells not only can produce multiple complex responses across the spike protein. But this is the other thing about uh, B cells, going back to B cells one more time. When they see a new variant, they don't produce antibodies to the old strain that they saw. They adapt their antibodies and produce them if they see a new variant against that variant. So no, I don't think variants are going to break through natural infection. On the other hand, I don't know how long natural infection lasts. And ultimately, I think that people getting a dose of the vaccine, even if they've had natural infection, is a good idea. But right now in the area of global you know, rationing and short supply of vaccines, I would first target people who have not had infection and then go back and give the vaccines to people who have had natural infection. Right. Um, this, is, uh, this is, again, I, I mean, I've been wondering about this. Um, a lot of the vaccines we have currently are targeting the spike protein and uh, spike protein mutations in the spike protein is all, are also what seem to make the virus infectious. So do you see a connection between the two, the fact that we've developed vaccines, so many of them so fast, so many different vaccines that the virus is being exposed to constantly and all of them targeting this one site, natural selection, I suppose, the mistakes that get selected and all of that. So do you think that is why the virus is becoming infectious so fast? That's a very good question. But I will say that there have been studies that have shown that what do vaccines do? They actually limit the virus from mutating as opposed to the other way around. The reason this virus is replicating and changing so fast is because we don't have global vaccine equity because we don't have enough vaccines. And I know, I don't think it is because we've applied vaccines to the virus, which is providing selective pressure for the spike protein to mutate. It's quite the opposite. In places that have high vaccination rates, we're not seeing the emergence of variants. In places that have low vaccination rates, that's where the variants are coming out. So it's a property, it's not like antibiotic selective pressure, which will put for example, a bacteria under, under pressure to mutate, to evade that antibiotic. It's a very different phenomenon with vaccines and with immunology. And the best thing we can do to stop variants is to get everyone vaccinated. Right. Um, I don't know if you've uh, had a chance to study the Covaxin data, the indigenous Indian vaccine. Yes. And the government of India has actually been saying that because it's a killed virus, it's a, it's a whole killed virus. It's not one part of a virus or a spike protein or an mRNA. Um, it has a greater chance of targeting all variants, whatever uh, existing variants, future variants. Do you think that's a plausible scientific argument? Yes, actually I do. So the good thing about Covaxin is it is really the whole inactivated virion, and thus you raise T cell responses and B cell responses against multiple parts of the virus. So if you have a Delta variant that has 10 or 11 mutations across the spike protein, Covaxin has given you an immune response against the nucleic capsid and other parts of the virus. So I think that that is a sound argument of uh, part of the pharmaceuticals about the Covaxin product. And um, however, right now, again, even the mRNA vaccines aren't evading the, the variants. And so I, I have always said, and many people have always said, give whatever vaccine you have. Whatever you have, that's the vaccine to use. So Covaxin is a great vaccine, 
So is Moderna. So is Pfizer. All of these are great vaccines. And right now, anything that we can do to give anyone a vaccine is going to bring down transmission. AstraZeneca included, by the way, Covishield, which I know you have a lot of in India. Yeah, that's right. We do. And what do you think of the way our vaccination drive here in India is progressing? You need to go faster. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I, 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 I think what happened in this latest wave in India was very tragic. And yeah. I know you, you know that. But I think, um, I think that uh, given that India had been exporting vaccines uh, prior to this, uh, was a true tragedy uh, that, that uh, Indian people weren't being taken care of first. And um, I do, you know. The wave definitely... actually happened three months after we had rolled out our vaccination program. So it was... Not fast enough, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, you know, India is complex. It's 1.37 billion people. There are many complexities there, but I, I have to say, and the, I, I think that it was sad that India wasn't yet vaccinating as quickly as they could, but I also blame the world. And why do I blame the world? It's specifically for this reason. In India and South Africa, went in October 2020 to the World Trade Organization, and they said, release the, the patents on the vaccines because this could happen. This could happen in India. This could happen in South Africa, which it, of course, is happening right now. Huge surge yeah. in South Africa. And the most important thing we can do is mass produce vaccines. And when India and South Africa went to the World Trade Organization in October 2020, they were turned down. And then there was a new administration in this country. And very soon after President Biden took power, he got a letter from big pharmaceutical companies saying, don't listen to South Africa and India. Don't waive the patents because that would hurt our profit. And, um, and President Biden did decide about waiving patents, but uh, un unfortunately, the EU has not. And so India actually did something very, very proactive to try to avoid this situation. And that is the world's fault that they did not work hard enough to waive patents and get vaccines out to the world in October 2020, when we could have anticipated what happened in 2021. So uh, 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 are you saying the world kind of succumbed to big pharma? or? Yes. Are you Okay. Yes. <laughs> I'm, not gonna, I'm not going to uh, sugarcoat that because I'm an HIV doctor, as you said at the beginning, and I have had a long experience with pharmaceutical companies not waiving patents for HIV medications for years and years and years after they were approved in this country and Europe. So while people were living and doing well with HIV medications from 1996 to about 2004, people in India, people in South Africa, people in Sub-Saharan Africa, people in the rest of the world were dying when they didn't have to die because we had HIV medication. So I'm very familiar with pharmaceutical companies and the patent issues mm -hmm. and Pharmaceutical companies will still make money, but a temporary waiving of patents would have helped India in October 2020, the minute that these vaccines hit the door, we would have had manufacturing capacity and we would have had production in India of the mRNA vaccines. And I don't think this same wave would have happened. So yes, I do blame pharmaceutical companies and I blame world trade and I blame rich countries. Right. Um, so our children have been almost nearly entirely out of school uh, for the last 18 months. Um, how important do you think is, is it that, you know, some people are saying that unless we vaccinate all kids, we shouldn't be opening schools. How important is it to vaccinate kids before school opening? You know, um, the one thing is that we're in the middle of a pandemic and children have not yet been eligible for the vaccines. We don't have the vaccines yet for children. They're still being tested. And on the other, other hand, with prolonged school closures, what have we seen? We've seen mental health effects. We've seen eating disorders. We've seen prop learning difficulties. And we've seen problems with children being out of school for this long. We've also seen study after study that shows that even in a pandemic, with safety and mitigation procedures in place, children can be back in school even prior to vaccination. And so I actually believe very strongly in school openings and having children back in school. UNICEF put out a quite 
quite damning report uh, just a month and a half ago that, that really goes through all the impact of prolonged school closures on children around the world, including in India. And so there are safety and mitigation procedures that can be utilized. They are masking, they are distancing, and they are ventilation. And India has plenty of ventilation. India has plenty of doors and windows. And um, it is important, I think, to have children back in school, even when we're not through the pandemic and even prior to child vaccination approval. Mm -hmm. But do you think generally children will need to be vaccinated? Or is it that they, I mean, if, if all adults are vaccinated and they have they, they respond better to the disease. I mean, they don't usually have serious disease. Um, so you're right that they don't have serious disease at even remotely to the same extent that older uh, individuals do. They are largely spared the effects of COVID-19, which is really a blessing. Um, on the other hand, children grow up. Children are exposed to um, people, especially in multi-generational households. And when we get the vaccines for children, and they're, if they're safe, it would be important to vaccinate children. But them being vaccinated prior to, as a requirement for a return to their normal lives and to go back to school, that I do not think needs to happen. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, so in the beginning, when I asked you about third wave, you, you said that you know we, we are probably looking at more ways because of the pace of vaccination 2022 is when we are aiming at. Um, what in that situation do you think that about countries like the US, UK basically making masks optional? I mean, if, if you're vaccinated, if you want to wear it, you wear it. Otherwise, you don't wear it. What is your opinion on that? You know, waves, when I say that there's going to be more waves and when the WHO refers to that, it is not actually in highly vaccinated countries. So as you've seen, we have opened. Um, the US has opened. Israel opened. The UK is going to open on Monday. And even in the context of those openings, with the higher rates of vaccination, what is happening is that COVID is becoming what we call an outbreak management situation. It is hospitalizations are we are seeing among really the unvaccinated adults. So those who have opted not to get the vaccine, even though vaccines are plentiful and available. Yeah, so essentially going, um, you know, what we're seeing now in these highly vaccinated countries is that rates of hospitalizations are going up among the unvaccinated. Cases are going up in general as people are mingling more, but they are not being linked to hospitalizations like they were prior to the onset of the vaccines, they're becoming decoupled from hospitalizations. And so countries like the US and the UK and Israel, even though it's really, like you said, the US and UK are gonna make masks optional for vaccinated people, the US already has, and UK is likely to do that on Monday um, indoors. It becomes a choice because you are highly vaccinated and you are highly protected. And I don't think that mask mandates indoors is going to change the pandemic I, in places that are highly vaccinated. I think what's going to change the course of the pandemic is getting more and more people vaccinated. We have a very unique problem in the United States, which is a lot of uh, vaccine hesitancy and a lot of politicization of the vaccines. Right. Um and, and what would you say, so India's currently got like something like five point something percent people who are fully vaccinated, but uh, would you say these people can go without vaccines? You know, the thing about the way I think about masks and vaccines is if you still have a lot of circulating virus, even if you're vaccinated, it's really a function of inoculum, how much exposure that you're getting to the virus and your personal vaccination status. So for example, um, because there was a first dose, first strategy adopted in India um, with the Covaxin and Covishield healthcare workers between the first and second dose were falling ill because they had so much exposure, right. so much inoculum. So it really is a function of both. And what I would be doing, and I've already encouraged my you know, vaccinated relatives in India is to keep on masking until we get to low community transmission. I think it, masking is really a combination of your personal vaccination status and the amount of virus you're exposed to. Mm -hmm. Right. And uh, what would you say in India, we've had, we've, we're talking about a third wave recently a lot. And 
we are already sort of saying that people are to blame, people are to blame, people are careless. Um, what is the likelihood of a third wave in India? You, do you see that coming? Not in India, actually, uh, luckily, and I really hope it won't, because what I've seen in India is that there was this terrible, terrible second wave, um, so terrible that you're all you know, going through it still, the, the aftermath of that. But what that did, um, very unfortunately, is lead to a lot of natural immunity. And at the same time, vaccinations are coming up. So as you go faster and faster with your vaccines, a third wave can be avoided as we get the immunity in the population up. And immunity is not just from vaccines, though that's the preferable way. Immunity is also from natural immunity, which um, very unfortunately you saw a lot of. Right. So, and, and this is this is my last question. Uh, so, is it is it now going to be that COVID vaccines will be a part of our life for the rest of the time we live? You know, it really depends on our again our global commitment. I think to getting out the vaccines now and keeping transmission low. Our global commitment to that, because our immunologic research shows that we need boosters probably not every year, probably maybe five years, 10 years. I think it will become a ongoing part of our lives. But if we need boosters more frequently, it will depend on what we do right now, which is getting out the vaccine everywhere, Sub-Saharan Africa, Southeast Asia, uh, Latin America, everywhere that this is happening, especially Sub-Saharan Africa, which is the latest place right. that's really affected. Um, everything that's happening, those are called surge vaccinations. Get the vaccines there now. And it really is, um, you know, we're already seven months too late with global commitment, but I am hoping that a lot of pressure is going to get things happening faster. I don't see any excuse for 11 billion vaccines to not be made available before the end of 2021. Mm -hmm. Right. Right, Dr. Gandhi, thank you. Thank you so much. That was a very interesting conversation. Uh, it Thank was you. Good questions. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. It was great to have you. I mean, I've been listening to your interviews. I've, I've been following you on Twitter. You, you have some very interesting ideas. So thank you so much for doing this. Thank, thank you. you.